is river morphology or what is river morphodynamics? Well, let's see some basic definitions. Geomorphology refers to the systematic study of shapes of the Earth's surface and the formation and development of those shapes. Then when we go to river morphology, that is a special branch and it deals with the shapes of watercourses. And that means bad topography and plant form. In a wider operational sense, it's not only about shapes, but it includes bad sediment composition, which is closely related to the development of the shapes. Well, morphology is an overall term. It's also applied to descriptions of shapes as they are used in physical geography. But morphodynamics is a part of that that deals with the mechanistic understanding and modeling of those shapes, the formation and development of the shapes and bed sediment composition. So here we see an overview. River morphodynamics regards river shape and bed sediment composition. And the river shape is a matter of bed topography. Uh, the bed can go down, which is bed degradation by erosion, or the bed can go up, uh, which is aggradation by sedimentation. But another aspect of shape is what you see from the air, the plant form, the pattern of bank lines. And bank lines can retreat by erosion, or they can advance by accretion or growth or floodplain formation. Now, what is essential to understand is that rivers transport not only water, which is the most visible part, but also sediment. And changes in the transport of this sediment produce erosion and sedimentation. And that is what changes the shape of the river. Now, there's a specific concept in engineering, which is alluvial rivers. Alluvial rivers flow in a bed of their own sediment that they continue to form and deform. So in engineering, this refers to the actively changing part of the river. Floodplains, in this sense, are not considered alluvial, although a geologist wouldn't agree, because floodplains also consist of material deposited by a river. But they are more stable, they uh, have formed already, and they don't play uh, a role in the morphological processes that regard engineers. Yeah, the sediment, where does it come from? Sources, of course, are in the upper parts of the catchment uh, due to erosion, mass wasting, mountain slopes, um, the landslides where the material ends up in the river, but also the rivers in the highlands uh, erode, they incise and thus generate sediment for transport downstream. But also further downstream, sediment enters the river by bank erosion, like you see here, an eroding island uh, in the river Brahmaputra in Bangladesh. And sand can even come in by the wind, as you see here along the river Nile at the first cataract, where you can imagine that the surrounding uh, desert with a lot of sand is a source of material for the river. So all these processes of erosion, transport and sedimentation of sediment give rise to shapes. And on a large scale, uh, a prominent shape is the bends that you can see from the air, meanders. And here you can see there can be large bends, like in the upper left corner, or small bends related to the smaller river in the lower right part of the picture. And there are some features that are associated with that. For instance, the point bar, which is uh, an exposed part of the riverbed at the shallow inner bend. You can also see that it is dynamic because some bends may be cut off and then remain in the landscape as an abandoned channel, a horseshoe lake, as a scar, a relic from past times. But if you look further in the terrain, you see that there are not only these horseshoe lakes related to bends in the smaller river, but also ridges and swales that suggest that they have been parts of uh, large river bends, like the one in the upper left uh, part of the picture. So it suggests that in a distant past, the large river 
to the left actually follow the course that is now occupied by the Spoiler River. This shows how dynamic morphodynamic changes can be. We can also have braided rivers in which channels flow around islands and bars. Zooming in further, we see bars, bars that may be at the inner bend. For instance, the one you see in the upper right corner in the Colorado River in the United States, or they may also be in the center, like islands, like you see in the lower left corner in the Amazon River in Peru. And then smaller features are dunes. We see here a few bars on which you see them superimposed on top of the bars. And dunes are uh, even smaller than the bars. And dunes can also be seen on this multi-beam echo sounding result of the Nieuwe Merwede River in the Netherlands. And interestingly, you not only see those dunes, but you also see some peculiar features here that are the traces of digging because the bed consists of very resistant clay and this river is not natural. It has been excavated in the 19th century and the traces are still visible in the hard clay on the riverbed. As I said, River morphology is not only a matter of shape, it's also a matter of bed sediment composition. And if we deal with graded sediment in the sense that uh, the sediment consists of a mixture, mixture of different grain sizes, we can have coarse and fine, let's say gravel and sand, and sorting processes can lead to segregation by which the coarser sediment end up in one place and the finest sediment ends up in another place. We can see that in the field, and we can see it in the laboratory. For instance, in this case, a laboratory experiment in a flume carried out by Astrid Blom, in which a homogeneous mixture of sand and gravel was exposed to flow, and after some time, dunes were formed, and the coarser material was accumulating in the deeper parts, in the troughs. So in the end, the result was that there was a layer of gravel, of core sediment, on top of which dunes traveled, dunes that consisted of pure sand. Another example of grain sorting in the Colorado River, the upstream part of the bar consists of gravel, the downstream part of sand. This Grain sorting can also lead to uh, all kinds of patches of different grain sizes. And that can be really difficult when you try to select a representative grain size in morphological computations. Because this is an exposed riverbed during low flow. But suppose that it is submerged and you have to make measurements of grain size by grabbing sediment. And you might take up uh, some gravel, you might also grab cobbles or grab some sand, and then you have to assume that that is representative for, for instance, a computational cell measuring 10 by 10 meters. This is a problem in general because um, the composition of a bed is highly variable, both in space due to these patches and time, because also in time coarser sediment may temporarily be covered by finer sediment, for instance. Yeah, and then we have been uh, explaining morphology as an interplay between water and sediment, but often also vegetation is an important factor. Uh, vegetation may provide roughness for the flow or resistance, may also bind sediment so that it is less erodible, but sometimes, due to bank erosions, trees may fall in the river and then deviate the main current, causing, uh, for instance, bank erosion on the opposite side. And it might lead to a totally new meander in the river plan form. So for natural rivers that are not too large, vegetation is an important factor as well. If you have a very large river, then 
vegetation may still be present, but it's too tiny, too small to have any influence on the overall morphodynamics. Yeah, and then the floodplains. We said that for an engineer, floodplains are not alluvial, they don't participate in the morphodynamic processes, but actually they do. Like you see here, that after a flood, sand has been deposited on a floodplain along the River Waal in the Netherlands. So there are different shapes and different features and phenomena in morphology that depend on the scale. And a good framework for studying this is the one proposed by Wright and Crosato in 2011. So at a larger scale, they uh, distinguish the basin scale, which deals with the drainage pattern and the river network of the full catchment. Then zooming in, we arrive at a reach scale, and that deals with the development of the longitudinal profile of a river. Zooming in further, we see the corridor scale, and this is where we study the style of a river, it can be meandering or braiding, and also it deals with the floodplains, the interactions with the floodplains. Zooming in further, we arrive at the cross-section scale, and then the relevant features are bars and channels and pools. Zooming in even further, we arrive at the depth scale, and then we deal with dunes, and viscarols. And finally, we arrive at the process scale where we see ripples, ripples that don't depend on how deep it is, uh, and also it doesn't matter whether the river is wide or narrow, they're just determined by the flow processes in the immediate vicinity. So this framework of scales is important uh, for selecting an appropriate a study approach and also uh, the right way of modeling. So it can be that if the focus is on another type of feature of morphological process, that you need another modeling approach, another software. This is an overview of what morphology is. I hope you are as fascinated by it as I am.